Okay, in this video tutorial, we're going to look at how you plot the sand rate of a graph, and then secondly, how you can use that to get a more accurate line and base to fit. So the first learning objective, you need to quite simply be able to understand how to draw in the sand rate of a graph, and then secondly, we'll try and take a look at how you use that sand rate to get a more accurate line and base fit, which is required for some past papers. Now, in some of the AS and A2 papers, you will be required to calculate the uncertainty of either the gradient of your graph or the y-intercept. <clears throat> now, if you're asked either of these things, you need to plot the sand right of your graph. And if you just want to pause the screen, copy out those notes, we'll then take a look at how you undertake this process. Right, now to plot the sand rate of your graph, you need to do the following things. First of all, you need to determine the average or mean value of your x values. And this mean value of x is denoted the symbol x with a horizontal line across the top, and that's referred to as x bar. Similarly, you need to get the average value of all your y values, y bar. You then plot this coordinate, x bar, y bar, on your graph, and this is your sand rate. Now, when you plot that sand right, please put a triangle around it, and this helps to differentiate your sand right from any normal plotting point you might see on your graph. And this is really denoted in the wee sort of illustrations below. So if this X happened to be your sand right, or this dot, put a triangle around them, and that helps it to make it very easy to see which is your sand right and what is your normal plotting points. But if you just want to copy down these notes and those two diagrams, before we progress. Now a worked example will prove to be quite effective to see exactly how you plot this Android for a particular graph. Now this table of results is a table of results I've taken in myself for an ohmic conductor in the school I currently work in a few years ago. Now what you need to do, and I do recommend you undertake this, um, this worked example yourself, fully do it in a piece of graph paper. So a graph of voltage on the y-axis and current on the x-axis is to be plotted. What you need to really do, first of all determine the average value of x or x-bar. You can then determine the average value for y, y-bar, and then basically complete the graph to plot your sand right. So label each axis correctly, scale it, as we've seen in one of the previous videos, and then plot your sand right x bar, y bar on your graph. So if you just want to pause the screen, copy down the table of results, copy down the various criteria you have to undertake, and then of course take, if it's 10, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, whatever, and fully complete this worked example. When you undertake that process, you should find that the value of X bar is 0.14 amperes and the value of Y bar is 0.77 amperes. And to get those values, you quite simply add all the X values together and then divide it by the total number of values, just given the mean basically. And similar to get Y bar, you add all the Y values together, your voltages and then divide by the total number of results you've got to get the 0.77. Now, step one. <clears throat> you need to label and scale your axes, both the x-axis and the y-axis correctly. This question did say potential difference on the y-axis and current on the x-axis. Do be careful. If you're instructed by the examiner to put a certain quantity, in this case PD in the y-axis, on the current on the x-axis, inevitably each year, 10-15% of students will um, invert the two axes, do it the wrong way around, and you're going to lose big marks for that. So do read carefully through it, make sure you do not make that mistake. Just a couple of checks on a couple of things we would have seen back in the graph or uh, the video series 6a and 6b. You need to make sure whenever you're labeling the y-axis and x-axis to put in your quantity, PD, and then current for I in this case, and then use that forward slash, and then put in the two units, V for voltage, and capital A for amperes. Secondly, just make sure you're using at least 50%, and you might recall in one of the previous videos, I recommended if you can, try and get at least two thirds, 
of each axis. And if you do check against your actual table of results, <coughs> this graph should enable you to use easily an excess of 50% of the X axis and easily an excess of 50% of the Y axis, which we'll demonstrate later on. So happy with that criteria. And the final check, again, this doesn't happen that often, but even at A-level, you will see these types of mistakes where students don't have this constant interval. Just take a wee check, first square, interval 0 0.1, and every other square up here, the interval is also 0 0.1, that's fine. And every single interval here on the x-axis is 0 0.02. We meet that criteria as well. Now perhaps down beneath your graph you might just want to summarize these notes, list the three bullet points, the three things you've checked for, and just clarify them by adding them into your notebook. The next thing we need to do is to put in a dash line for the average x value x bar. And quite simply go to the x axis, the average value I was getting there is 0 0.14 amperes, so go to the 0 0.14 amperes and put a dashed line vertically upwards and label that X bar there for the benefit of the examiner. Again, just to stress, we've talked about this in a few of the previous slides, the wee horizontal line on top of the X is used to denote the average, and this is called X bar, or it can be called X bar, and I recommend definitely put the wee horizontal line across there, and that will add a little bit of value, and also help to communicate what that means to see it as well. So you can pause the screen if needs be, add in any further clarity to your graph or perhaps just to note along the bottom as well. The next thing we need to do then is to plot in the value of y bar and again just go to that value in the y axis, come across horizontally with a, with a dash line and then label that y bar. Again this wee horizontal line on top there is just the average we call this y bar. So again if needs be pause the screen Tweak your drawing if needs be, or your graph if needs be, and add in the wee extra bit of notes along the bottom as well. Finally, <coughs> where those two lines intersect each other, that's where your centroid is. You can put the wee dot down, or an X if you wish to, and then put a wee triangle around that just to differentiate that particular point from any normal plotting point you will get on your graph. So that'll make more sense whenever you see the series of results plotted in the same graph. It really does bring to your attention quite clearly which point is the sand point centroid. If needs be, pause the screen. You can maybe tweak your drawing, add in the triangle or dot if needs be, or add any further detail you need. And look, that ticks off the requirements of the first learning objective where you now understand how to draw the centroid of a graph. The next thing we're going to look at now is to understand why that centroid is used and ultimately is to give us a more accurate line of base fit. Now look, your line of base fit must pass through the centroid. And look, the line of base fit chosen passes through the centroid and as many other points as possible. And make sure there's as many points above the line of base fit as there are below it, as we talked about in the previous video series. Furthermore, the points above the line are as far from the line of base fit as the points below the line are from the line of base fit. And again, if need be, do refer back to video 6b where this concept of well-rounded was discussed in detail with some visual aids there in relation to completing the line of base fit. And if you want to pause the screen now, copy down these notes before we dive in and take a look at exactly what this means for this particular experimental set of results. Now, the line of best fit must be rotated while passing through the centroid, either clockwise or anti-clockwise, to give you the most well-rounded result. Difficult to sort of see what that means until you see a visual aid. For the exact same set of experimental results, we've got our centroid in there, and let's imagine your blue line is your current position of your ruler for the line of best fit. You can basically rotate that ruler counterclockwise about that particular centroid to give you the most rounded line of best fit, or you can rotate it clockwise about that centroid. But your line of best fit must pass through this centroid. As you can see, all three examples here 
are all passing through the centroid, you have to rotate it clockwise or anti-clockwise uh, to try and get the most well-rounded line of base fit. And if you just want to pause the screen, copy that top statement down and definitely copy out this graph from scratch with the wee annotations in there as well. Now, the line of base fit has com been completed beneath for the experimental set of results that you've used in the previous example to draw that centroid. You can see in this case the line of base fit does pass through the centroid, so it meets that particular criteria. There's roughly as many points above as below, so we've got one point above there, another point that's two, three points above, and we've got one, two, three down beneath. This point here is not that far away from being on the line of base fit. But look, it does seem to be reasonably well balanced in this case. It's never going to be perfect, all right? It's never going to be exactly the summation of the distance above, exactly equals the summation of the distance beneath, but as long as it's close. So the example I would interpret that there, it looks pretty good, it passes through the centroid, it's very well balanced, and you'll get your marks for that in the examination. Okay, so if you just want to pause the screen, copy down the statement, copy in that uh, graph with all the plotting points now added with your completed line of base fit for this experiment. And that takes off learning objective two, where you now hopefully understand the benefits of using that Sandroid to give you the most accurate line of base fit during your experimental results. And that really concludes this wee video tutorial. Do check out the next two where we'll look at how we can use the Sandroid to then get the uncertainty and both the gradient and the y-intercept as well.